everybody, Cassie here from the Salmon Center. Here at the Salmon Center, we have a program called Salmon in the Classroom. And Salmon in the Classroom is where we work with 11 schools around the area to give them the knowledge of um, the Pacific Northwest salmon species. So here today, we are going to give you a presentation on the whole life cycle of the salmon. We normally do these in three different sections, but here today we're going to make them in one big chunk of the life of the Pacific Northwest salmon. So today in our schedule, we are going to start with the six types of Pacific Northwest salmon. Then we're going to go in and talk about the three habitats that the salmon live in, talk about the seven phases they go through, and then at the end we're going to talk about the, how, why they are called the keystone species of salmon. So, as we get started, we have the six types of Pacific Northwest salmon. Um, we will start out with the chunk or the dog salmon over on this picture over here. As you can tell, each picture has a top and a bottom photo with a different coloration to it. Um, the top on all of them is the ocean one, except for this one. The bottom one is the ocean face color, and the bottom one is their spawning stage color, which we will talk a, lot, a little bit more when we go into more detail about the spawning phase. So, we have the chum or dog salmon. We go in and talk about the sockeye or the kokanee salmon, the chinook or the king salmon, which is the most popular one a lot of people know about. Then we go in and we have the coho or silver salmon, pink humpy salmon, and lastly we have one that's not really a salmon but is still considered a salmon, the steelhead trout. So here is a way to remember the all of the salmon species. So if I can have everybody hold up their hand like they're going to give somebody a big high five and go through the um, labels with me. All right, so we're gonna start out here with the thumb. So chum rhymes with the word thumb. So chum is with the thumb. We go into the sock eye with the pointer finger because you don't wanna sock your eye out. Then we go into the middle finger, which is also, known, also the largest finger, which is also correlating with the largest salmon as the king salmon. Then we go into, we have the coho or the silver salmon correlated with the ring finger because sometimes you may wear a silver ring on your finger. And then we have the pink or the humpy salmon on your pinky finger. And then last but not least, we have the steelhead trout to bring them all together. Hey everybody, my name is Daisy. I'm an environmental educator here at the Salmon Center. And here today to talk about the three salmon habitats. Those are freshwater rivers, brackish estuary, and ocean with salt water. So at the freshwater river, it's where the salmon will start as eggs and end as spawners during their life cycle. Um, this, they're normally in the rivers for a couple of years, um, then transitioning into the estuary, brackish estuary. Um, um, this is where they spend the shortest amount of time in any of the habitats. Uh, it's only a couple of months and this is in the middle of their life cycle. Um, it's so short because it's getting them used to a little bit of salt water because it's a combination of salt water and fresh water, um, which makes it so it's an easier transition into the ocean, uh, which is where they will spend three to seven years of their lives as an adult. And this is where they will continue to grow before going back to the rivers. All right, and our next topic is gonna to be on the seven life cycle phases of the salmon life cycle. So as you can tell, it goes in a complete circle. So there's not really a specific um, beginning or specific end, but we do, so technically the beginning life or beginning stage of a salmon's life would be the eggs because that is the technical first stage but also we need to talk about the spawner who lays the eggs. So it's kind of like the chicken and the egg kind of, the chicken and the egg um, debate on which one comes first. And we're just going to set a little debate here and say that it is the spawner um, that lays the eggs. And then the eggs become the fry, fry become par, par become small, small become adult, and then small, the adults lead back into the spawner phase and end their lives, by, but leave behind some eggs to continue out their lives. So, throughout the spawning adult phase, they will need the cold water, they will need a riverbed with gravel, 
And some of the threats that they may go through is temperature change, gravel disturbance, pollution, and predators. So when, they, when we talk about predators in the spawning phase, the spawning phase, they are older, they are not as fast as it moving as anything, so they are pretty easy targets for anything um, close by the rivers, like eagles or even seagulls, as they are moving slower or staying just still in the rivers. So during the spawning stage, they will build a red, and they will build a red by finding a good area, a rocky, a rocky area, and pretty much using their um, back tail fin as um, like a broom. And they will sweep it around, make sure it's all clear, clean off those rocks to make sure it's a safe place to lay their eggs, and then they will spawn and lay their eggs in that area. So what is a red? So a red is a salmon nest. If you were to come past it throughout, or like in a regular day, down at a stream, it may look something like this. You can see there's a little slight decoloration um, to tell that there are there's something habitating in there. But if you look a lot closer, it will look clearer like this with a lot of vibrant red colors um, protruding so you can see that the eggs are there. Once they are, once the spawners are done spawning and have laid their eggs, that is when the salmon's life cycle is complete and they die. This is the part where we would ask our students, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Some people may say it's a bad thing because then their life is over. The salmon die, they can no longer live on, but it is also a good thing for the surrounding areas and the habitat around them. So after, their body, after they die, the body stays in the river and that is where the body starts to decompose, where it becomes vitamins and minerals for the river and the nearby rivers, nearby rivers and nearby forests with the trees. Um, we've actually read studies that um, show tree or show uh, forest growth with salmon laid out on one side and salmon not laid out on the other side and it actually shows that having salmon decomposing bodies along one side actually helps the river grow faster and better than the side that does not have any salmon nutrients throughout it. So that's pretty positive opinion or positive effect in my, in my opinion. So, of all the six species, the Pacific Northwest species that we have just talked about, um, all of them are anadromous. I want everybody to say anadromous while you're at home. Yes, so anadromous means that they all migrate to the sea and return. So they will all head out to the river through the estuary and make their way back to the river. And then, they are all also semelporous. I need everybody to say semelporous. And this means that they will die after spawning. Except, except the steelhead, who is iteroporous. Need everybody to say iteroporous. Which means that they can migrate to sea, return to the river and spawn, and do that life cycle multiple times before they die. So there is anadromous, semelporous, and iteroporous. So, now that they have spawned and laid their eggs, these are what the eggs look like. So, these eggs don't look like much, but they are little. I've also had them compared to Orbeez, the little water, water beads. Um, so, that's what they kind of look like. If you look close enough, you can see this little black dot in here. That is the eye. That eye is not fully developed yet, but it is the first developing body part of the salmon. So they can't see you through it yet. They're not watching you as you lay there, as you have them in your eggs or in your tanks, if you have them. Um, so during the egg phase, they need cold water, shelter in riverbeds so that they are protected because they can't defend themselves, and gravel to incubate so they can continue to grow strong and um, then hatch. Some of the threats that they could have would be temperature change, gravel disturbance, pollution and predators. They are in this phase for roughly a month to two months, depending on the um, temperature and the weather conditions, the, the water conditions that they are living in. So once they are out of the eggs, or once they are, um, once they have fully developed in their egg stage, 
this is when they start to come out of their eggs, or out of their, out of their shell. And become alevin. So in the alevin stage, they look like this little guy, not quite a full blown salmon yet. They still need the cold water. They still need the shelter in the riverbeds and the gravel to hide in because they still can't protect themselves. Some of the threats will go into habitat destruction, pollution, and predators, and they will be in this phase for roughly two to one to two months as well. So during the elephant stage, they will hide in the gravel like we have mentioned. They will hide in here and eat all of their yolk sac until they absorb all of it. So if I were talking with the kids right now, I would ask them which part they think is the yolk sac. Well, this little part right here looks kind of funny on them. That is what the yolk sac is. Right on there, right in here. This is the stage looking like your, or this is the beginning yolk sac stage. This is it absorbing a little bit more. And this is it being fully absorbed. So I want you to think of the yolk sac as having a lunch box attached to your chest and that is the only place you will get nutrients from. You don't have a mouth, so you're not able to, your mouth isn't fully developed yet, so you aren't eating any outside sources of food, so you need to have that yolk sac, just eating from there, and that's why you need to be safe in these rocks, so you're able to absorb all these nutrients, become nice and strong without having any kind of disturbance through that. Um, yes, so then once they absorb all of it, and they become strong, then they become, the, they get into the fry stage where they start to actually look like normal fish. Um, so during the fry stage, they still need that cold weather, cold water. This is when they start to need complex streams because now they're starting to move around. They need protection a little bit more. And they also need macroinvertebrates. And macroinvertebrates are something that they eat and we will get into that a little bit more soon. Uh, and then their threats could be, some threats to them would be habitat destruction, migration delays, predators, things like that. And they will be in this stage for up to one to two months. So during this stage, this is where they start to create the swim bladder. And they create a swim bladder after their yolk sac has been buttoned up. They create a swim bladder because now they don't have any more nutrients to eat in from their swim bladder. They don't have any more nutrients to eat from their yolk sac. So they go from swimming on the bottom of the water to going up to the top of the water, taking a big gulp of air, creating this swim bladder inside them, which gives them the ability to swim, stay afloat, and then eat more, eat outside sources of food. And that is where macroinvertebrates come in. So they have two jobs that they need to do now. And the first one is they need to eat. And what do they need to eat? They need to eat macroinvertebrates. Macroinvertebrates are insects without a backbone that you can see without a microscope. So there's something that you can see when you're going fishing and you look under rocks or you're in a stream and you see something moving around. They're most likely macroinvertebrates. So here are three examples that we have up here of different macroinvertebrates, starting out with the dragonfly, mayfly, and the caddisfly on the bottom at the top view is when they are in the nymph stage and the bottom stage is when they are um, fully grown and I always ask the kids which one do you think they eat the most or they the salmon enjoy eating the most and it is the top one because they are still living in the river these and these ones are born these macrovertebrates are born in the river so they're very accessible to salmon and they're but they live pretty much in the same habitat. So they're definitely easy to find and eat. They also, salmon may also eat other salmon eggs. And I know that may sound like a concerning thing like cannibalism, but it's okay. It's not cannibalism. Salmon don't really think about their egg, like their litter mates as siblings. They think about their litter mates as just other eggs or other salmon. So, when another salmon doesn't quite make it, they just end up becoming nutrients that is surrounding them. So it's just like them eating another macroinvertebrate rather than them eating another egg that they might have been their brother or sister. So they don't really have that emotional attachment like we would. It's more about surviving for them 
than it is about having that emotional connection. So the second thing that they do is imprinting. I want you to think about what the word imprinting means here for a second. So imprinting means using the senses to get back to their natal stream from the ocean. So as we talked about in the habitats, they will go from the river to the estuary to the ocean. And so they'll start when they're a fry to get getting all this information gathered in them as they're traveling throughout these stages and making their way back to making sure that they are getting to the right, the right location of their natal stream. So, once they have made it out of the par, or once they've made it out of the fry stage, they make it into the par stage, and this is the par stage is when they are leaving the rivers and heading towards the estuary. So, during this stage, they need a lot of cold water, they need complex streams because they're getting larger for the predators that they might run into, and they still need the macroinvertebrates that they have been continuously eating. As we talked about, the threats could be predators, habitat destruction, migration delays, and the time that they're in this stage depends on the species. It could be a little bit, it could be a couple weeks, it could be a couple months, depends on how long they need to survive in that stage for. So during this stage, this is where they create the marks. So par marks, par stage, makes sense, right? So they only keep these marks while they are in the estuary so that they are able to protect themselves from other um, from predators or other animals. Um, so we have chum in most of our classrooms and they have the, the, these little tiny little par marks on the top. Not a whole lot of them. There's nothing really underneath them as well. Just depends on the sizing and the coloration of them. Like the far, like the biggest the biggest one with the Chinook, they have the largest Largest oval marks to make sure that they are fully covered. Depending, and then we have the pink fish or pink salmon over here that doesn't have any par marks at all because they are the smallest. So they use the um, par marks to protect themselves, and they are protecting themselves from guys like these guys. They are protecting them from blue herons, bald eagles, the cormorants, and the kingfishers. I know working here at the salmon center, I have seen all four of these species on our property near our est the Union River estuary and we definitely have a good stock of salmon that come through that I'm sure that they have eaten for lunch every once in a while. So now that we have talked about the par marks we're going to go into the next stage which is the smolt phase and the smolt phase is as they make it through the estuary and so the needs they, need, they have are having a safe estuary habitat like the brackish water. The brackish water, remember, is where the um, salt water and the fresh water meet and come together. Um, so they are adjusting to making their way from the fresh water into the salt water of the ocean. Some of the threats could be habitat destruction, migration delays, and predators. And they could also be in this phase for up to, from two to six months. Yeah, they could be in this phase for up to two to six months, depending on how long it takes them to adjust to the salt water content as they get further and closer to the ocean. So as we, um, can you pause me? All right, so during the smolt phase, they go, through a, they go through something called smoltification. How ironic. So to become a smolt, they need to flip on a filter in their gills to filter out all the salt water that, they, that is going through them that they don't need. So it's not like a technical flip where they would flip on a switch like underneath their gill or something. It's just a flip in their mindset um, to make sure that they are filtering out that salt and not letting it come into their body and overtaking over them. So they in the freshwater streams, they let in um, any salt because there's not very much in there. And then they get into the, the salt water or they get into the estuary where there's still not a lot of salt but there's still some more so they need to um, filter that out a little bit more but then as they get into the ocean there's so much that they need to make sure that they are pushing that out and making it for a safe content for them to live or a safe habitat for them to live in and keep on surviving through so now that they have survived their way from the estuary into the ocean 
now they're in their full adult phase and they you might see them and they will look a lot like this in their salmon their salmony silvery color they're not quite salmon pink right now but they will be so during this time they are going to need cold and clean ocean habitats and an abundance of forage fish so forage fish are just fish that are in smaller sizes than, than they are so the threats could also be things like migration delays and predators and commercial fishing commercial fishing if you don't know what that means it could mean if you've ever seen shows on discovery channel um called wicked tuna or um deadliest catch um those shows are definitely are um things exa good examples of commercial fishing um and they just catch fish at a, a very fast high speed rate um that the salmon are not able to keep up with that so during their life they're during their adult phase life they um while they're in the ocean, they can travel up to 3,000 miles. So that can be about 18 miles a day, or if you think about 3,000 miles in total, that is from um, Los Angeles, California, all the way across the country to New York. And that is a really long time. Going 18 miles a day, that could probably take you about a year. That would be a long time. And they're doing it just by sheer willpower of their body to find more food, to find protection, to find a nice habitat. So during this time, they will feed on smaller fish like this little guy, feed on invertebrates like this one over here, um, and create crustaceans to make sure that they, to help them grow in size. They are growing in size and keeping themselves um, strong because they need to protect, fend off large predators. Can anybody think of any large predators that salmon may have out in the ocean? I want you to take a second and just think about what those could potentially be. If you guessed the killer whale or the orca, you are absolutely correct. We have a little picture of them down here, which doesn't do the size justice, obviously. Um, but orcas or killer whales uh, are the biggest predators of our Chinook salmon out in the Puget Sound, out in the, um, out in the Pacific Ocean. So salmon are considered to be a keystone species. A keystone species is a species which has a disproportionately large effect on its natural environment relative to its abundance, which means that other species depend on salmon more than salmon depend on them. So, you guys can ask yourself these two different questions. What do salmon depend on during their life cycle? And who depends on salmon during their life cycle? So, salmon depend on oceans, um, estuaries, rivers, macroinvertebrates, other types of food sources, all throughout their life cycle. Who depends on salmon during their life cycle? Just to name a few are us humans, uh, eagles, bears, um, other type of wildlife creatures, but to get more in depth, we have this list of 167 species which depend on salmon. I am not going to read it out loud to all of you, but you guys can pause the video and look through them. If you find anything that's interesting to you, go ahead and leave a comment for us. To wrap up, <laughs> salmon help the ecosystem by doing many different jobs. They clean the riverbeds when making a gravel run. They keep the ecosystem in balance and deliver ocean nutrients upstream to plants and animals. So you guys uh, made it through the salmon life cycle. Congratulations. Congratulations, you guys. You have completed the salmon life cycle. We have told you about the habitats, the um, things that they eat, the things they need. Um, we thank you for watching this video. If you have any comments or any questions, Please leave them below. We thank you for watching this video and hope to see you next time.